Okay, so next video, we are gonna talk about 10 things to not do with your Tosa. We have Mr. Dante still here with us. We're recording all of these in the same day. Um, I'm a bit behind on videos and I wanna get caught up. So unfortunately, these are all recorded the same day. Please forgive me. Anyway, 10 things to not do with your Tosa. Do not fight. Number one, do not try to fight your Tosa. I don't know how uh, obvious this should be, but do not try to fight your Tosa, okay? Um, there are, like, uh, with so many other breeds that have been used for fighting, they don't have to say this, right? Um, it should be obvious. It's the thing that goes without saying. Um, and you, you, you don't see that in their videos, but with the Tosa, we're dealing with a very, very special breed in the sense that, again, fighting is all they do in Japan. That, that's it. They don't do protection work. They don't do guarding work. I don't care who you see that says that they're used as guard dogs in Japan. That is entirely antithetical to everything they want in a Tosa dog over there. And anybody who says that they're used as a guard dog obviously hasn't spent much time talking to a dog man. <laughs> over there so i just want to say that um and get that out there this is all they do and when you're talking about other dog breeds that have been used for fighting especially here in the u.s these are dog breeds that have um certain physical attributes certain temperament attributes that people think would make them a good fighter and then they start breeding them for that purpose or training them for that purpose but historically these dogs were not used for fighting not true with this guy the breed as a whole has only ever been used for fighting in Japan and they are still used for fighting to this day. So just getting that out there. <laughs> um, that's why it's, we're talking about it in this video. Um, you'd be surprised at how many times I get contacted by somebody who thinks they can just, I don't know, call up a Tosa breeder and ask if they can fight their dogs. No, <laughs> it's not a thing. It's never been a thing. It's not going to be a thing as far as we're concerned. So... All right, next. Um, do not try to dominate your dog. You hear so many people these days talk about alpha this, alpha that, dominant this, dominant that. It is so overused. And I'm saying that as a dog trainer and behavior therapist, it is so overused. Get that word out of your vocabulary. Um, Leader is a better word. Yes, you do need to lead your dogs, but it's not about dominating them. I mean, think about it as a parent with their kids. Yes, you have to lead your children, educate them, guide them, nurture them. But is it about trying to always be in control and, and boss over them and, and show who's boss and all that other kind of stuff? No, except for when you have a, a nine-month-old daughter who's super bossy and doesn't do what you say anyway um that's not that's neither here nor there um anyway when we're talking about dogs if you try to get into the realm of domination um there are certainly some tosas who are happy go lucky and they don't really care and you'll get away with that but there are other tosas who are very much sensitive to that and aware of it and if you get into the realm of trying to dominate boss coerce these dogs you're going to end up getting in front of a dog that would rather die than lose and when we're talking about a dog of this size being more willing to die than lose you're going to end up in a very very dangerous situation very very quickly so when it comes to it do not try to dominate your dog you can earn their respect, you can earn their trust, you can be their leader without having to always have conversations about who is alpha this, alpha that, alpha that. So anyway, I'm gonna get off that soapbox, we're gonna move on. Um, do not half train your Tosa. And I'm gonna go ahead and say that again. Do not half train your Tosa. Whatever you do with your dog, do all the way. Complete it so that you don't end up in situations where you are relying on training that's not all the way there. You can get in a lot of trouble very quickly. Um, so don't half train. Don't go for budget training where you can get the um, five classes or 16 classes for a hundred bucks training that's gonna get you a certificate at the end that allows you to go places 
where you're going to encounter things that are real world situations, you know? Um, when you train your Tosa, make sure you have someone who knows what they're talking about and go all the way through the training, whatever it is. Um, go all the way through whatever training you're, you're paying for, you're, you're getting. Uh, do not skimp on that. <clears throat> Retirement. Do not try to retire your Tosa. And this honestly goes for any dog. There are some dogs that will happily quit working at the age of five years old and they can retire and go out to pasture and be nothing more than just a happy house pet, a mascot, you know? And then there are some dogs. I knew I knew of a husky female that, um, let me see here. She ran, the relevant dates are nine and 13. And ages are nine and 13. And I want to say she had her last litter at the age of nine. And she ran the Iditarod at the age of 13. And those might be reversed. But I think that was it. Anyway, the Iditarod is a 500 mile race. All right. And this dog did not just run it or complete it. She was up there with the top dogs. Okay, so when it comes to a dog like that, you try to retire her, you're going to be very, very, very disappointed with the results, <laughs> okay? Um, so what, I, what I'm saying is do not seek to uh, make your Tosa live an easy life. Let them tell you what they're ready for and, and kind of play that by ear. Um, you might have some, again, that are ready to lay back and live the easy life as soon as they reach maturity. And then you might have some that are go, go, go until the day they die. You know, so don't rush to retire. Retractable leash. Do not put your Tosa on a retractable leash. All that happens is you go from tension to no tension. And we've been over how powerful this dog is and these dogs are. In this space, that's enough to yank your wrist out of socket. Like the 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 amount of force and momentum this dog can guarantee I mean can can gather in so much space is so high that a retractable leash is an injury waiting to happen for you, for sure, for your dog, more than likely, when they pop that collar. And also, when they get to whatever they pop the leash to get, you know, that's probably going to be a pretty huge liability. So when it comes to it, do not get a retractable leash for your Tosa. Even with dogs that aren't as powerful or as large, I'll still say a retractable leash is for a trained dog. And it's kind of unnecessary. Um, we can get into that. You can check out our dog training videos and, and see about um, retractable leashes at some point. Uh, when we get those videos up. But for now, just know, not for your Tosa. Table scraps. Do not give your Tosa table scraps. Um, you might say, hey, but I've seen you feed your dogs raw diets and you make your dogs food. And yes, I do. Um, or should I say rather, yes, we do. But we don't give our dogs table scraps for a few reasons. One, it stops. it starts bad habits. Um, never give your, your dog the idea that they're going to eat off of your food plate, your plate, your food, whatever. Um, they have no business in the area you're eating even. Um, but when it comes to it, the, the biggest reason why I don't do table scraps is because there are actually things in the seasoning that can be very toxic or, uh, allergenic for your dogs. Um, and you don't want to do that. As a matter of fact, um, one of the most unfortunate cases I've ever had the, uh, tragedy of working with was a dog that was fed nearly exclusively people food. Um, I can't give more information than that without letting, without doxing that, doxing these people. So I don't want to do that. I'm not here to shame them. Um, they, they didn't know any better, but when it came to it, that dog was extremely unhealthy compared to what is uh, standard for that dog and their breed. And um, he actually passed away from something that was, I mean, super basic, super rudimentary, uh, an exercise level that you wouldn't even consider exercise. And he, his heart exploded, you know. So when it comes to it, do not feed your dog table scraps. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about tie-outs and crates. 
Tie out cables and, and crates in general are not a bad thing, but they are not for untrained dogs. And that goes for any dog. Um, they are not a good substitute for exercise tie out cables. Um, they are not a place for your dog to be happy all the time. People who leave their dogs crated um, all the time. No, it is a holding place. It is a small space. And while it might be comfy and familiar, it's not a place to live their lives, you know? So when it comes to it uh, further, when we're talking about Tosa's, tie-out cables and crates are for dogs that want to be there. Long story short, I've had Tosa's that come straight through a crate. I mean, straight through it. I don't care what kind of crate you made. They will go straight through it if they're properly motivated. Same thing with the tie-out cable. Um, I've not met a thing that I could tie my dog to that they didn't work out. Aside from a properly established full-grown tree. Small trees, young trees, they've uprooted. Uh, fences, they've pulled down. Um, I had a dog tied to a... Um, tied to a... a uh, support beam for a porch for a patio uh, on a house and that dog pulled that support beam right out so when it comes to it um, I do not recommend these for untrained dogs I, I would say it's fine for a short period of time for a dog that is uh, trained and or used to that sort of thing but if you have a dog that is um, you know, for whatever reason, displaying signs of discomfort with an activity and you, excuse me, you put them in a crate and continue that activity or put them on a tie out chain and continue that activity. Um, you're asking for it. You're going to get whatever he's going to do, you know, and same idea. If you have a Tosa on a tie out chain and somebody's uh, dog is running by and again, you did not socialize your dog or train your dog at all, they will happily rip up that tie out cable and go right to doing whatever they're going to do sniff the dog play with the dog fight the dog whatever it is they're going to go do it so tie out cables crates reserve those for trained dogs kids um are tosas good with kids i have never had i'm trying to think of it make sure i'm not saying this erroneously yes so i have never had a tosa of mine period whatsoever go after a child and i have had tosas that have happily told adults that were uh trying to try something on me that if you don't get back i will kill you you know um i've i've had i've had a tosa that um was not approachable by strangers unless i told him it was okay and even then he still kept an eye on them um, and that same Tosa had a child repeatedly charge at him, some stranger's child charge at him with a plastic bat with intent to try to hit him with it. And I did not once have my dog growl at that child. Um, so that said, would I leave a Tosa or, or any dog really unmonitored with a child? No, uh, I think that they're great for kids. I don't think that they're great for disrespect. So when it comes to it, um, again, I don't think any dog is great for disrespect. So I would just keep an eye on your dogs and your kids. Um, that said, here on our property, uh, we have five acres. I make my child take a dog with him wherever he goes when he goes to explore, you know. Um, so when it comes to it, I, I just I recommend against... Um, leaving small children and dogs unmonitored. Uh, when it comes to kids, teach them how to interact with their dog respectfully. Your dog should not have to suffer through a child putting their finger up places that are exits only, you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, simply because they're expected to be great with kids. Um, I'm going to put it like this. Don't expect your dog to put up with behavior that you wouldn't. And if you wouldn't be okay with a kid sticking their finger up places on you, don't expect your dog to be okay with it. If you wouldn't be okay with a child coming up, some random stranger's child coming up and yanking on your ear and pulling it hard, you know, or sticking their finger up your nose to as far as they can get it, don't expect your dog to be okay with that. That's not a thing. 
when when it comes to dogs in in nature wolves uh coyotes whatever and your dogs even among their own pack they're only going to tolerate so much and they'll tell you hey knock it off and the problem with that is is that again they're going to tell you in their language they have thick skin and they're designed to be able to take a certain amount of bite force your child does not have thick skin and they are not designed to take a certain amount of bite forth force especially from those right so when it comes to it teach your child respectful interactions and your dog will be just fine i'm gonna get that off of you before it gets on my clothes ah, yeah. <laughs> The next thing I would say is uh, never encourage bad behavior with your dog. And th that's your dog. Notice I said your dog. Um, doesn't matter if it's a Tosa or not. Never encourage bad behavior. What I mean by that? Don't encourage your dog to jump if you know that you don't want a 120 pound dog jumping on you sometime later on down the road. Don't encourage your dog to get aggressive with strangers if you don't want to have a dog that you can't have around others and have to always keep an eye on because they're a liability. Don't encourage problem behaviors. Don't encourage your dog to chase cats. I'm going to say that again. Don't encourage your dog to chase cats. I don't care if you think you're okay with it, if you think you're never going to get a cat. I had cats at different points in my life, but I, I thought that I'd never end up getting one as an adult. Well, I got married and my wife likes cats. And chances are we might end up getting a cat someday. And having dogs that are trained to go kill them and go ch chase them is not going to be good. You got a little eye boogie boy. So when it comes to um, behaviors and working with your dog, your Tosa in this, in this instance, but in general, when it comes to working with your dog, don't encourage bad behavior. Don't encourage problems that you're going to have later on down the road. Don't congratulate your puppy for being tough when you don't want your, your, your grown dog to get aggressive, you know? So just, just think about that, you know, think about it in the long run. Don't encourage bad behaviors. Um, Another thing I would say along that line before we move on is encouraging behaviors that you're okay with that you don't think other people might be okay with. Say you are okay with jumping. You're a six foot eight grown man who weighs 300 pounds and you're okay with a 150 pound dog joining you in a wrestling match. Understand this. If something happens to you and you have to give your dog away or something happens to you and other people have to take care of your dog, what are the chances of people being able to other people being able to deal with that? What are the chances of other people being able to um, deal with whatever you've taught your dog to do? Slim to none. And if that's the case, chances are your dog is getting put down for something that is so easy to prevent and avoid. And, and honestly, if the shelter had the right kind of help the, to train out, but it's, it's not getting trained out and the dog is getting put down. So just think about it. Think about it long term. So there's that. Uh, the last thing I would say to never do with your Tosa, never ignore problems. Never, ever, ever ignore problems. I don't care if it's physical problems and you think that, you know, is it supposed to be growing like this? Is this, uh, is this the way it's supposed to look? I, I don't care if it's a psychological problem and it's like, uh, you know, uh, he's a little this or he's a little that, but it's okay. You know, it's within reason or it's not so bad that I need to train it. No, don't ignore problems. Get on them, get on them early. Um, I don't know how many dogs lives I've saved, um, because of getting on problems early. I had one instance where I had a puppy who was, he's typically super, super playful, super happy, go lucky. And now he's just kind of, meh. And you get out his favorite toy and meh. And I'm like, okay, this is extreme behavior for this puppy. Now, again, that requires knowing your dogs because in that same, in his same litter, there were puppies that were just kind of normally super chill. And it wouldn't have been outside of their behavior for me to see that. But for this guy in particular, he was super meh, you know? And um, that day, and I remember taking him to the vet and come to find out he had parvo, you know, um, I was able to save his siblings. I was not able to save him. Um, but when it came down to it again, um, 
it required getting on that issue, that problem immediately. I could have very quickly lost his, that whole litter, you know, um, instead of being able to save what I did. So when it comes down to it, um, get on problems the moment you see them. Uh, I'm not saying to necessarily be a helicopter parent and constantly always wondering, you know, but get on problems immediately. Don't wait to see what they what happens, you know, um, and, and I think you'll be OK. And that goes again with any dog breed, but all the more with your Tosa. They're a bigger dog. Your vet bills are going to be more expensive if you let things develop more. Your your uh, training is going to be a lot more problematic if you let things develop more because um, you're going to find a lot more people that are willing to work with a, a Shiba Inu than you will find people that are willing to work with a Tosa Inu, you know, or even an Akita Inu, you know. So when it comes to it, um, get on things, get on them early, nip them in the bud, and you'll be all right. Thank you guys so very much for checking out our channel, for watching our videos. I hope I wasn't too boring. Thank you for for uh, for following us or watching us. If you do not already follow us, please follow. If you have not liked this video, please like um, and uh, please subscribe and you'll be able to keep up with the next videos we put out about Tosas. Um, we love what we do here. It'll, there'll definitely be more videos um, and you can learn a bit more about the breed, learn a bit more about us. Um, and, and uh, hopefully it'll be stuff that you'll find useful. Um, one other thing I might would say is that if you can, please share our information. Um, I know a lot of people will say share, share, share. Um, but for us, it's actually more important. You may not know this, but the Tosa is um, what we might consider an endangered species here in the US and even in the West. Um, what dogs are out there are by and large owned by people who, um, they don't know much about the breed and they, um, they, I would say the, the, the place that the pit, or excuse me, the place that the Tosa is right now is not unlike the place where the pit bull was in the mid 50s throughout the uh throughout the 70s in that um they no longer are used for their original purpose here in the u.s thank god they are not used for their original purpose um so that kind of leaves a vacuum and people are buying them less and less as far as um, the breed's notoriety is going down in that vacuum but what that opens the door for is for bad actors to get a hold of what remaining specimens there are and use them for, um, we'll say, nefarious purposes. And when it comes to it, um, this is a wonderful breed. We just barely got the pit bull to where it's like 50-50 publicity, right? I'd hate for the Tosa to be the next dog everybody hates. So... Please share as much as you can. Get the information out there about the breed. It took so long for the pit bull to make a comeback, not because of breeding and responsible breeding practice. No, there's always been people that have been breeding pit bulls responsibly. You know, um, what it took was having people in their corner, advocates, people who could stand up and say, that's not, way, that's, that's not the way pit bulls act in reality. That's a dog that's been abused. That's a dog that's been mistreated. That's a dog that's been mistrained. And that can happen to any breed, you know? And the more that those people get out there, the more you see the pit bull coming out in a better light, you know? Unfortunately, it's still got a long way to go, but that was the change. And the same thing is true for the Tosa. We need people who are going to get out there and say, hey, look, that behavior right there, that's not a Tosa. This, this, that, the other thing, that's not Tosa behavior. This is an example of an unfortunate set of circumstances that befell an individual dog. It is not what is to be expected of the breed as a whole. Um, so when it comes to it, uh, I, I think it's super important that you share, 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 even more than liking and subscribing, which would be awesome, but share so that the information gets out there and more people learn the truth about the Tosa. All of it, not just the, the, the fighting past, but where they are today, 
and and where they're headed. Um, hopefully, uh, more people will see this, more people will, will share, and the information will be out there. Again, you don't necessarily have to want to get a Tosi yourself, but learn about the breed. Um, we need more advocates. Hopefully, uh, some people watching this will find that true and become an advocate for this wonderful, amazing breed. Thank you guys so much for your time. We'll um, let you let you go and, and enjoy your life and let Mr. Dante get on to his kid for the day. <laughs> yeah.